So I'm going to read from Susan Sima, Finding the Mother Tree. Ecosystems are so similar to human societies. They are built on relationships. The stronger those are, the more resilient the system. And since our world systems are composed of individual organisms, they have the capacity to change. We creatures adapt, our genes evolve, and we can learn from experience. A system is ever changing because it's part. The trees and the fungi and people are constantly responding to one another and to the environment. Our success is coevolution. Our success as a productive society is only as good as the strength of these bonds with other individuals and species. We can think of an ecosystem of wolves, caribou, trees and fungi, creating biodiversity just as one orchestra of woodwind, brass, percussion and string musicians assemble into symphony. Or our brains, composed of neurons, accents and neurotransmitters produced through a compassion. Or the way brothers and sisters join to overcome a trauma like illness or death. Through this creation, our systems develop into something whole and resilient. I'm an I am going to die at some point, but we knew for sure he was going to die because he'd been given a diagnosis, um, motor neuron disease. It felt like we were walking along together on the same path. Um, we both had some idea of uh, the future we might have together. And then motor neuron disease told us we there would be a point, he knew when, that we wouldn't be on the same path. So maybe there's something about him having to come to terms with dying and me having to come to terms with carrying on. It wasn't that we were necessarily therefore separate, mm. that it felt, you know, the image that might came to mind was of two paths converging and, and get parting and converging and parting. Even at those times when the path was divergent, a bit like in a forest that has a space through the canopy where, like the Leonard Cohen um, song, um, was it a crack where the light gets mm. in? I could still see him through the forest, even though we might have been on different paths. Mm. That makes me think about the, the, the idea of accompaniment, how we go forward alongside each other together as a way of being resilient. You know, it's thinking about what connects us, whether that's visible, whether that's spoken, whether that's witnessed. Mm. Um, and, and being joined with other people is complicated mm. because, for example, I think you were talking about cultural stories, I think simple questions like, how are you, yeah. are impossible to answer because you have to make a decision, if I say how I really am, mm. do I risk pushing them away mm. and alienate them? Mm. But if I don't really say how I am, then do I risk alienating myself and mm. feeling isolated? Mm. And so you know, we came up with the idea of saying, um, I'm okay or not okay today, but so the, the, the theme of time is quite important. But yeah, so joining and being witnessed and being known and witnessing a, a complicated act. Complicated and, and they're also connected to the um, social discourses about illness somehow and how we respond to illness. Well, an, an illness that has a cure 
elicits a sense of hope and a sense of relief. Um, an illness that doesn't have a cure requires people to do something different. Mm. I think it requires people to be... My goodness. To, to find hope in a different way. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking as we're talking, what does an illness that doesn't have a cure require of us? Compassion, mm. um, love, um, humility. Lots of humility. Maybe connection with a bigger picture, with the bigger world that actually... Makes sense to do the bigger picture. Yeah, because when you get a diagnosis, it is like a... A tsunami, it does mm. feel like you're going to get swept away. Mm. That's where my impulse to protest came from, mm. because actually this is outrageous. How could this have happened to us? Mm, my husband to be diagnosed with motor neuron disease at 42, 43 years of age, that's outrageous. Outrageous. But then on top of that, there's a whole set of discourses that then you're up against. Mm. In the case of motor neuron disease, you know, maybe there will be a cure, but at the moment there isn't. And so we can't change the fact of death, but we can, maybe the change is in how we understand the constructs we're expected to fit in and the yeah. way, and, and maybe have a think about that actually. Maybe that isn't how we have to do this. So, so maybe that's how we don't witness fully. We just witness yeah. according to our cultural models also, isn't it? You know, if you if you go and visit an ill person, you will witness in this way. People sometimes look for answers and, you know, sort of have hopes invested maybe in things like genetic testing mm. and... And whether there's something about um, uh, and, w and whether that's something about our say something about our culture or whatever the idea that there's a sort of a, a privilege afforded to achievement or yeah. outcome or um, results or or cure or cure and. And yet maybe what's less visible or less audible is something about the journey or the process and how we are with people mm. um, and what that means. I think it goes back to a bit narrow one story of what it is to live and what it is to die. Mm. Too much Hollywood, too much... Capitalism really, it comes to me and sounds a bit stereotyped, but the, the, those are the, the, the mm. guidelines we have. Mm. Then it's very hard to kind of go against the, mm. the, those very heavy mm. discourses that organize mm. how we need to live our lives. Mm. And um, I like your image of like going to a protest with all these people around me mm. um, getting ready for a different way of mm. living and dying. So while Jim, for example, didn't always look forward to having people visit because he would see his physical illness and his deterioration through their eyes, it wasn't a sort of witnessing that he felt comfortable if um, people had read about motor neuron disease mm. and came to him with some knowledge or asked him about um, his interest in technology that would help him to communicate through um, eye movement, for example, mm. that, was, that was a different sort of joining. It was a different sort of witnessing. It was mm. a... There's something active about that, and those sorts of conversations were about him living with the illness, not dying from it. I, I've been reminded of, you know, that I've been doing some something called the 
tree of life. There is this type of practices requires looking at our lives through the collective eyes. And, and you may me think about the joining eyes from Jim and the people who would witness him. Mm. It's a beautiful metaphor to think about our lives like a tree. And I think about the, the fungi now, mm-hmm. kind of. This is almost a new, a new introduction to a new thing for this tree of life. I need to think a little bit more about that. But... Also, we think about the storms. You were talking about the tsunami a minute mm. ago. So, so storms of life, you know, forests, they go through storms and there are animals in the, in the forest that mm. they respond to storms. And mm. the way we respond can be very visible, like mm. we think about animals responding to the storm. But then there is this fungi things that might be invisible to the eyes. Mm. And, and that's something... Um, that might um, give us some sense of, um, I don't know, some sense of, you were talking about compassion, or invisible compassion mm. almost, that is not visible to the eye. Mm. Um, if Jim is feeling a bit more hopeful because somebody is witnessing him and asking about the possibility of communicating in a different way, mm. this might be invisible to to other people's eyes, but for him might have been something very important. When Jim very first got his diagnosis, he said something like, which I found incredible, he said something like, um, well, there isn't any difference between us. Um, We're both going to die. It's just that I'm going to die sooner and I know that I'm going to die of this. And I I don't know where the capacity to say that comes from. I don't know. That feels like... uh, I think... I mean... I think we forget that we're going to die. I think we forget, I think we both think as humans we're the most important. Again, we value life at one level, isn't it? Because you were saying you you will know a lot about dying because of Jim. Mm. So he's not gone. Mm. He's gone. It's a part of him that is gone. Mm. And he's present in your life, Mm. your memories in the way you think about things and you mm-hmm. live your life. And we think this is true for, I don't know, I think about mm-hmm. my grandparents, how present mm-hmm. they are in my life in many ways. Mm-hmm. There's also something about being accompanied by your children. How do you have conversations, talk, how do you have conversations with your children about about the illness. How do you allow your children to accompany you in such a in such painful territory? I think it goes back to I maybe I'm organized by trees now that we talk about even planting a tree, isn't it? If we need to plant a tree. I'm trying to plant tulips and I need to wait until they are a bit more cold, apparently. Mm-hmm. But um, I learned some things yesterday looking at how to plant my tulips. And there is so, it's so important to prepare the where you're going to be planting the tulips. So I'm thinking it's not so much about um, that moment when you're going to talk about to your children that you have this shocking news, uh, but how you prepare beforehand and, and there is th- something maybe for all of us there is something about preparing the territory mm-hmm. you know the, the, the terrain because we don't have the answer mm-hmm. and it goes back to the art of conversations and the and the, the stories of families Mm. and uh, the impossibility of imagining we have a recipe for everybody, Mm. how to talk about motor neuro disease when it comes to visit you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, 
I was sort of wondering, thinking about trees and forests, about, I don't, um, I don't know this, but what contributions the little trees make to the forest. I love the bandy. Right. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> if the fungus, which are even smaller, make a lot of contribution, <laughs> imagine the little trees. Wow. 